Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so yeah, thank you for the invitation. So I'm very, very happy to give this talk today. I think uh, application of uh, pharmacogenomic research uh, or dissemination of pharmacogenomic research into clinical practice is indeed an important point, and I hope that I will catch uh, the audience attention and, and interest uh, with this with these slides. So a short introduction about myself. I'm an associate professor in drug development and personalized medicine at Karolinska Institute and um, also the deputy director of the Bosch Institute of Clinical Pharmacology in Stuttgart in, in Germany. And as a, as a short disclaimer, um, for a commercial uh, side, I'm, I run a company called Hepa Predict, which uh, develops drug testing modalities for the pharmaceutical industry. So today we'll be talking about rare variant pharmacogenomics and, and ethnogeographic variability. And first, some some introductory slides about uh, the importance of uh, genetic variability when it comes to adverse drug reactions or or lack of response. So, as uh, the audience likely knows, uh, intended drug response and outcomes are only present in uh, a majority, but uh, by far not all patients that are receiving pharmacological treatment. And estimates indicate that around twenty five to fifty percent of of Treat, uh, of patients are not responding to uh, treatments as they are intended to. And the majority of those can, can of course, be explained by a variety of, of different non-genetic factors, drug drug interactions, uh, various physiological and pathophysiological factors, environmental factors, and also drug adherence is, is, of course, a major issue. But estimates indicate that it's around 20 to 30 percent of those uh, unintended outcomes that are related to genetic factors. And then those parts can be further subdivided into uh, variations in ADMI genes, ADMI standing for absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion, um, which can affect drug response, as well as genetic variations in uh, drug target genes and uh, MHC genes, so major histocompatibility genes, uh, which are related to uh, HLA toxicity. So I will go through these now in the, in the next uh, slides very briefly. So uh, pharmacogenetic, uh, pharmacokinetic variability uh, that can affect how uh, a given compound is, is either metabolized or, or taken up. So these here are examples for metabolic enzyme polymorphisms where increased functionality of an enzyme uh, can more rapidly um, metabolize and, and inactivate a active uh, molecule and thereby resulting in decreased exposure in the individual, uh, while a reduced functionality enzyme would result in increased exposure of the individual, simply because the, the active parent compound is not uh, broken down as, as uh, rapidly as it's supposed to be. And then vice versa, there's also uh, prodrugs, and uh, in, in prodrugs, of course, the, the pattern is entirely inverted. So an increased functionality enzyme now would result in increased exposure and a reduced functionality enzyme in, in decreased exposure. So this is sort of the initial principle of pharmacokinetic variability, and one could make analogous cases with uh, transporter activity. Um, when it comes to drug targets, these are primarily but not exclusively uh, relevant in oncological therapy. And uh, there are different, again, different uh, flavors of, of how pharmacodynamic variabilities or variability in drug targets can affect drug response. Uh, on one side, it can be that uh, genetic variants are abrogating drug binding uh, when a variant is directly in a, in a binding pocket. And I will have some slides for that uh, later on, on, on our own research. And then on the other side, again, mostly in, in targeted therapy for, for oncology, uh, there is there are efforts for designing uh, drugs that are specifically targeting only exclusively certain variant proteins that are enriched in, in certain cancers. And um, lastly, um, it comes to to altered immune response, which uh, again can be linked to genetic variations, and, and these are now major majorly in these HLA genes, um, which are part of the major histocompatibility complex, and um, it's a highly polymorphic locus, and uh, certain variants there can can bind to a very specific subset of, of drugs, which then in, in turn causes uh, activation of, of neighboring T cells and downstream um, responses or activations of the immune system, which are are um, very similar to to autoimmune diseases. Uh, and again, I will go through some some more details a bit later on. So 
First, I would like to very briefly discuss the SIP gene family. So these are cytochrome P450 genes. And why I'm highlighting those is that uh, they are involved in uh, the oxidation and metabolism of around 75% of all new drugs. So one, I, I think, can, can make a very good case that uh, SIP genes are, are um, the most pharmacologically important family of drug metabolizing enzymes. And importantly, um, they most of these are, are lacking endogenous functions. So there, there are some uh, examples like CYP3A4, which also metabolizes endogenous um, substrate, uh, such as testosterone. Uh, but most of those others are either lacking endogenous functions in its entirety, or at least the endogenous functions are not um, very much essential or selected for. And as a consequence of this, SIP genes are generally under very low evolutionary pressure and therefore are, are highly polymorphic. So as an example of a polymorphic SIP gene, so um, there, there are two different uh, categories here. So SIP2D6 uh, and SIP2D6 can uh, vary on an on a entire structure level, so which means in some individuals, the entire SIP2D6 gene locus is, is completely deleted. Uh, in others, there are individual point mutations, uh, which are causing usually reduced functionality. And in yet again, other patients, uh, the CYP2D6 gene is, is copied multiple times. So it's a copy number variation. And uh, as a result, these individuals are expressing substantially more CYP2D6 and then resulting in also substantially higher CYP2D6 uh, activity. So which means there's both individual mutations that only affect uh, certain selected uh, uh, residues in the in the gene and duplications or deletions of the entire gene body itself. Um, I would like to to emphasize the Pharma uh, website to the to the audience, which is a website by the Pharmacogene Variation Consortium. And it's a highly important and useful resource to uh, parse genetic variation in uh, pharmacogenomically important uh, genes in case there's, there's interest for uh, looking up details and, and getting uh, insights and links to, to further reading. So this is really a, a globally curated uh, expert uh, database with uh, important information about uh, those allelic variations. Um, so when it comes to SIP activity, um, how can we measure this? This is this is rather rather seminal information. So um, based on on therapeutic drug monitoring or uh, the exposure to probe substrates. So on the uh, y-axis here, one sees the the number of individuals in in one uh, exemplary study here, and on the x-axis the metabolic ratio. So the metabolic ratio is the ratio between the parent compound and its metabolic uh, product. And these are the different classes here of uh, metabolic phenotypes that are present in, in different individuals, again, ranging from ultra rapid metabolizers, which have multiple copies um, of a gene or increased activity of the gene, uh, to poor metabolizers, which basically don't have any uh, functional copy of the gene left. And one can nicely see that that the distribution of those uh, metabolic phenotypes is uh, far from from Gaussian, but rather is a is a multimodal distribution. So with with different uh, specific and, and dedicated peaks that then can further be uh, linked and associated to uh, certain genetic variations. So this was the the original findings, which then uh, kicked off the the entire genetic investigations into factors that might explain these uh, clear and distinct phenotypic differences. For instance. Um, so here, a, a rather recent example of, of an overview of different uh, variants of individual uh, polymorphisms and how they are associated with uh, different adverse drug reactions. And one could draw similar tables with uh, associations for uh, drug efficacy phenotypes. And the point here now is, is not so much to, to go through those individual associations, but I would like to bring across that the uh, indications that have been found are, are rather diverse. So you see that there are some uh, for SIP genes here, which I uh, illustrated previously, uh, other metabolic enzymes in, that are uh, participating in phase one metabolism, such as DPYD, also very well characterized and being linked to uh, fluoropyrimidine toxicity, um, various less well-established, I would, would argue, uh, phase two associations, 
um, GST, so glutathione S transferases, uh, UGT enzymes, TPMT, uh, different transporters. So this is, I would argue, the, the most well characterized associations um, of SOC1B1 variability with the Sebastian myopathy, uh, myopathies and various um, well-established associations of uh, toxicity events with variation specific allelic variants in the major histone particulate complex. So this is what I what I showed you previously was about individual variations, and now I would like to to delve into the, the actual topic of this talk with uh, this background in mind, saying that okay, there have been those those selected variants um, and allelic variations that have been characterized, but the whole human pharmacogenomes contains a plethora of additional genetic variants that go way beyond those uh, selected and, and highlighted candidate variations. So this year is, is data from a genomic analysis of, of more than 60,000 individuals, 208 different pharmacogenes that are known to be involved in uh, the, either the transport, the metabolism, or excretion of um, drugs that are approved by the pharmaceutical industry, um, as well as few others that are that are regulating those expressions and meaning having trans effects. And overall in this genomic data from, from those 60,000 individuals, whole exome sequencing data, uh, we found that that those uh, individuals harbored around 70,000 individual distinct genetic variations. And um, most of those variants were indeed found uh, in uh, those genes with poor evolutionary conservation. And that is particularly the, the transporters of metabolic enzymes. And I would like to direct your, your attention here specifically to this panel D at the bottom right corner, which indicates that from those 70,000 uh, diff different and distinct variants, 98.5% uh, were present in less than 1% of individuals. So which means while there's a huge uh, variability and diversity in genetic variations in pharmacogenes, um, most individuals are carrying indeed variants that are either unique to a single person, 51.1% of all variants were only found in a single individual, or that are at least very uh, rarely found also in, in other individuals, which means that it's intrinsically difficult to study those variants with conventional association studies, in which one then uh, directly compares variant carriers to non-carriers to identi identify and analyze which phenotypes they might result in. So that raises important questions. So how to how do we actually make sense of this genetic complexity, right? And um, there's on one side the experimental uh, tools and and ep uh, epidemiological analyses. As I said before, uh, this is this is complicated when it when it uh, reaches these very large numbers of genetic variations. So one can um, reasonably conceive that that one can test individual variations, maybe 10, maybe 20, maybe 30 or 40 um, in in the lab, for instance, using, using experiments or in, in genetic association studies. But that becomes very difficult when it comes to 70,000 variants that are supposed to be tested. So therefore, uh, due to these practical limitations, the field is very much utilizing uh, computation predictions algorithms. However, also they have intrinsic problems and limitations. And um, this is what I would like to discuss briefly uh, on this slide here. And that is that the um, computational prediction algorithms, they need to be trained on uh, variant data in order to uh, arrive at a conclusion or uh, on new variants that have not been part of the training data. And of the computational prediction algorithms use as training data sets diseases associated variants. So variants where one knows, okay, those might be rare, uh, but once they occur in a given individual, then they're associated directly with a certain genetic disease and most of the time a Mendelian disorder. Uh, so direct pathogenic variants. And as a negative test set, so variations that are considered to be functionally neutral or benign. They use variants that are common, usually with frequencies, any variant with a frequency of more than 5% or more than 10% in a, in a large population scale sequencing project, such as the Thousand Genomes Project, with the, with the argument and hypothesis that, okay, once a variant is uh, that frequent, it can't really be pathogenic or under strong evolutionary conservation. 
And as a consequence of that, evolutionary conservation uh, appears as a key feature for judging variant pathogenicity, which is maybe not surprising. But when we now transfer the same concept to pharmacogenes, this raises major issues and, and limitations. Specifically in pharmacogenes, as I um, tried to illustrate and show you previously, there are variants such as clear loss of function variants, such as even, even up to the deletion of the entire gene locus, which occur quite frequently. So some of those loss of function variants have frequencies of 10, 20, 30 percent in the in the overall population. So they are clearly common. And in those uh, prediction algorithms, they are part of the negative test set. Um, on the other side, the positive test set, which is associated with variants that are directly associated with pathogenicity, is virtually devoid of pharmacogenetic variations, simply because those are never associated with the disease due to their lack of endogenous substrates. So, and as a consequence of, of these limitations, um, the use of conventional computational prediction algorithms is highly problematic when applying to, to pharmacogenes. And um, it requires specific algorithms for pharmacogenomic uh, effect predictions. We and others have, have in the past now, now developed those and, and have shown that there's indeed an improved uh, accuracy when it comes to the prediction using direct dedicated pharmacogenomic algorithms. But there's still uh, more work to, to be done, and I will skip that now for the sake of this talk. Um, so the next aspect I would like to go into, so, so having now established that at the complexity in, in the pharmacogenomic variability is, is um, tremendous. Not only is there large inter-individual variability, but there's also ethnogeographic variability, and that is uh, what is referred to as population pharmacogenomics. So this is a, an overview of uh, different important functionally relevant allelic variations in uh, different uh, cytochrome P450 genes. In this case, again, data is based on, on more than 55,000 individuals. Uh, stratified by different uh, ethnogeographic background. And what I would like to bring across here is that the patterns of uh, the prevalent genetic variations really differ drastically. So variants or uh, variant combinations are in the field expressed as these uh, star alleles here. So that's why you see star 35, star 9, for instance. Those are different uh, constellations of, of variants, so meaning different variant alleles. And what I would like to emphasize here is that you see, for instance, here, this uh, particular one, star 19, CYP2A6, star 19, highly prevalent in East Asian, South Asian, and ethnic American populations, but virtually absent in, in Africans and Europeans. Other examples for CYP2D6, where the dominant variant uh, here is star 10 in East Asians, uh, and again, a variant that is basically absent in, in Europeans or are very rare also in Africa and even in, in South Asia, so geographically relatively close populations. So there's tremendous ethnogeographic variability when it comes to, to the underlying factors that are then explaining those phenotypes. And that means that from a clinical perspective, there's important implications what should actually be tested for in a given population. Um, this is an, another overview of those uh, genetic differences and how those differences are then also translating into differences in SIP activity. Again, stratified by the most important SIPs. And um, you can nicely see that the uh, variability that exists is drastically different uh, between different uh, geographic regions and, and also, of course, between uh, different SIP genes. For example, SIP2C19, so um, individuals with uh, non-normal functionality, which is most of the time reduced, is much higher here in, in Europe, as well as uh, South Asia and Africa compared to um, South America, for instance, as uh, one example. And similarly here, East Asia, uh, East Asian populations have a much higher frequency of uh, poor metabolizers or reduced metabolizer phenotypes in uh, CYP2 to 6, whereas this is much higher compared to uh, admixed Americans or, or South Asian populations. So again, having important implications for, for the outcomes of such uh, therapies. And that is not only true for, for cytochrome p for 50s but also for uh, other important pharmacogene classes. This is one example of a nice study describing the variability in a drug transport called OCT1, uh, where the, the pattern that I just illustrated is sort of inverted in uh, different South American populations. Uh, those individuals are 
highly commonly not carrying a single active allele of the OCT1 transporter, uh, whereas in, in East Asia, for instance, um, the reduced functionality alleles are very rare and, and almost all individuals carry two active alleles indicated in green here. Further example, HLA genes. Um, HLA genes are strongly affected with very severe adverse drug reactions to a couple of selected medications. Abacavir is uh, directly associated with this allele called HLA-B star 5701. Carbamazepine is uh, toxicity, uh, again, cutaneous toxicity effects are uh, associated and related to, to, to different HLA alleles and um, also allopurinol hypersensitivity. Uh, is associated with yet another uh, distinct allele. And we and others have, have analyzed this data quite extensively. So specifically for HLA alleles, we tapped into a, an organ donor database uh, that carries between 3.5 and 6.4 million uh, individuals across 74 countries. And um, that is the, the data that we then used to map those uh, variant prevalences for those uh, specific HLA risk alleles. And this is just showing now one example, HLA-B5801, which predicts risk of allopurinol toxicity. And you can very nicely see that this is an allele that is enriched here in um, primarily in, in East Asia, but also in, in South Asia and parts of Africa. And whereas it's basically absent and, and devoid of any frequency in, in uh, Europe and uh, North uh, America. So... That me that is uh, as I mentioned before has important implications for preemptive uh, genetic testing on a national level. So, um, for instance, one could consider that preemptive testing might be more relevant in uh, those countries in which the prevalence of the given risk allele is, is higher. Whereas, if the risk allele is absent, then it makes rather limited sense uh, for for actually preemptive testing, and um, it also implies that then from a cost-effectiveness modeling perspective, one can directly compare first-line uh, therapy for, for all patients. So, for instance, allopurinol and the management of ADR uh, versus universal preemptive genetic testing and first-line therapy, which is then only applied to negative patients and alternative therapy to, to positive patients. And again, I will not go into now the, the detail of, of um, our cost-effectiveness modeling efforts in this regard, but it becomes clear that um, already from these initial slides that um, the eventual outcome and the calculation of those cost effectiveness measures are uh, a rather complex evaluation that critically relies on such information about ethnogeographic variability of the underlying genetics. And I in, invite the interest of readership in, in further reading here uh, the, the resource given at the bottom right. So now I would like to leave uh, these parts parts behind and speak a little bit about uh, drug target variability. Um, so previously I talked about pharmacokinetic variants and variability in HLA genes, so meaning overall uh, genes that are rather poorly conserved. And now I would like to go into drug target variability as drug targets are distinctly different from these pharmacogenes in that they are uh, much better conserved. So this is a, is a very nice and elegant study. Uh, in which the authors analyzed uh, G-protein coupled receptors, which are uh, a main class of drug targets. Uh, again, analyzed around genetic data from around 60,000 individuals and identified a total of 14,000 different uh, mutations. And importantly, those different mutations also covered uh, function or regions of those proteins which are known to be functionally important. So, for instance, the interface directly of the G-protein coupled receptor with the G-protein, ligand binding domains, uh, residues that are known to be a substrate for post-translation modifications and related PTMC and so on. And so then the, the authors focused on some of those individual variants and actually characterized their effects on pharmacological therapy and um, experimentally. And I think this is a, is a very nice example of the mu opioid receptor characterization, uh, where the authors focus on three different uh, variants in, in, the, uh, in the protein, in the receptor, uh, used a biosensor called BRAT, and then treated those different uh, mutants in an in vitro context with uh, different uh, compounds that are either agonists or antagonists uh, to the uh, to the myopioid receptor. So morphine, for instance, and a clear uh, uh, agonist, um, 
was producing a strong agonistic effect in in the wild type, uh, which is the black line here, as well as uh, two of the variants. But those this red variant, which encodes a uh, amino acid exchange at position 153, those red variant uh, responded much more poorly uh, to morphine than uh, the wild type enzyme, already indicating that there's some some difference. Similarly, uh, propenorphine, uh, which is a partial agonist, sh shouldn't activate uh, to, to that extent. That produced similar and expected responses. So in the, and in the uh, mutant that I illustrated previously here, indicated in red, basically a response was entirely absent. I think it becomes most interesting now when, when looking at naloxone, which is an antagonist. So naloxone is actually the antidote given to individuals that are experiencing acute opioid overdose. And naloxone should drastically abolish and reduce the activity. And one can nicely see that here. So the white type uh, enzyme upon exposure to naloxone doesn't produce any response anymore. So in the white type, it is actually a true antagonist. However, in those two different uh, mutant enzymes here, we see that naloxone, not only is it not an antagonist, but it is actually an active agonist. So it directly activates the uh, receptor to a point of the same level as, as morphine. So it's a strong agonist. And again, to, to remind you that these are variants and mutations that were actually found in a population genetic study. So which means they are naturally occurring mutation. And one can only imagine what, what uh, such an effect would then do to an individual carrying such a mutation. So receiving the antagonist and further um, activating and compounding the effect that is already experienced in by an, an acute opioid overdose. So this nicely illustrates that that genetic variation in drug targets can have conceptually and fundamentally different pharmacological outcomes. And beyond GPCRs, um, that is a study that that we've done uh, during the last year. We analyzed all FDA approved drug targets, so in total six hundred six different uh, drug pro uh, different proteins or genes. Um, then we further narrowed it down to all those targets for which a 3D uh, crystal structure was available. We analyzed naturally occurring variants that were directly within six angstroms then of the actual binding site within these 3D structures. And that resulted overall in uh, the study of 110 target genes and, and proteins. And we then mapped the genetic variability of 130,000 individuals on top of these uh, different 3D structures. And we first find that um, the aggregated frequency within those uh, direct binding sites, uh, drug binding sites, was was overall lower, but nevertheless considerable. Um, so overall, uh, around 17% of uh, individuals carried a variant directly within uh, a drug binding pocket to a clinically approved medication. And so we then chose a couple of those examples, so ACE, for instance, uh, being one of them, and evaluated the response to different ACE uh, ligands here. Uh, and we found that among those variants, again, naturally occurring variants, we saw drastic and strong variability in the inhibitory concentration. Coptopril, for instance, we saw 19-fold differences uh, in the IC50 concentrations between those different naturally occurring mutations. And we could then map that also further on the on the 3D structure, and we found that indeed uh, specifically, those variants that were uh, provoking a strong, strong difference showed indeed a reconfiguration of the uh, molecular pocket. Similarly, for, for BCHE, so a cholinesterase, um, we analyzed a couple of naturally occurring variants here. And um, the majority of those variants indeed entirely abolished uh, esterase activity, whereas there was an additional variant, this D90AG variant here, uh, which slightly significantly but slightly reduced activity. So we went further into into evaluating then the, the effect of this variant, uh, specifically using Tacrin. And uh, Tacrin, uh, we saw very strong and highly significant uh, increase in uh, the activity upon of this, this mutant enzyme uh, upon Tacrin exposure. So which means that those individuals that are carrying this variant are directly Tacrin resistant. And that is uh, interesting and relevant first from a from a historic perspective because this variant has been described already around 70 or 65 years ago 
uh, to cause succinylcholine induced uh, apnea. And that was first described in by Karloff in 1957. So it's one of the very first molecular pharmacogenetic indications. So it's it's nice that these data go go a bit full circle. And um, also it is highly relevant because the allelic frequency of this variant is actually 1.7% in the European population. So which means frequency of 1.7% as a result around 3, 3.5% or so of individuals are carrying at least one of those uh, risk alleles. And that can have important implications for, for also overall therapeutic resistance to tapping. So we went one step further and then asked, okay, could we actually now modulate uh, the tacrin molecule to overcome that resist specifically in variant carriers. So to apply a, a personalized or precision drug development approach, if you wish. And for this, we collaborated with uh, Dr. Jan Korabetsny uh, in, in the Czech Republic. And what he provided is uh, different derivatives and uh, conjugates of, of tacrin uh, molecules. And we identified some that had a very clear inhibitory effect on both the reference enzyme as well as on the on the uh, resistant mutant on which uh, normal tacrin had much uh, lower effectivity. And we even identified some molecules that we didn't f- further follow up, but we even identified some molecules uh, where the mutant enzyme was more sensitive to inhibition than, than the uh, white type normal enzyme. So with this in, in mind, then, um, we, I would like to, to summarize these parts in where pharmacogenetic evaluations and implementations are uh, currently standing in, in our opinion uh, or in my opinion personally and how that is developing further uh, into, into the future. So the, the conventional view of pharmacogenomics is indeed to use uh, primary genotyping methods, which are usually either based on SNP arrays or uh, conventional PCR profiling of a small set of variants, which which is mostly smaller than, than 100. And then those variants are indeed usually quite prevalent, um, well characterized, and have already a vast body of evidence in uh, that can guide the clinical decision making that is then based on the presence of such, such variations. This is then expanded and, and whole exome sequencing is, is at least now in, in some countries, in, including Sweden, where I'm currently based, quite extensively used. Um, so whole exome sequencing can, can cover many different variations. Many thousands of variants are identified then in, in a given individual. Those variants are, uh, in, in many cases matched to a, to a variant database. That unfortunately uh, is, is trained on pathogen, pathogenic data, and I tried to illustrate the, the issues related to this in, in um, one of the earlier slides. And then this is combined with computational prediction methods, which are then in turn based on this pathogenicity data. So, and as a consequence of this, any variant that is identified beyond those that are well characterized and experimentally characterized, the predictive accuracy for those individual variants is, is rather low. However, in where we believe the field is going in the, in the future is that first there, there will be further extension of the genetic testing. So, um, from whole exome sequencing, which only sequences the coding parts to, to also potentially consider whole genomes. Um, and at least in the beginning, this can be, uh, as a, as a consequence of, of repurposing of those genetic variations, for instance, in the context of, of cancer therapy, uh, where uh, many cancer patients are already undergoing whole genome sequencing. Um, this is then related directly to apne specific data sets. So uh, to, instead of using pathogenic variations for uh, model training, this is used to specific pharmacogenetic data sets. And in this context, I would like to mention deep mutation with scanning as one of the main methods to generate uh, those large data sets for true and high confidence function training of such computational methods. And that should result in a, in a considerably higher predictive accuracy, while at the same time uh, utilizing the entire personalized genetic information for tailoring of, of therapy and treatment outcomes. And so the highlighted deep mutation scanning, I would like to spend the last few slides explaining a little bit uh, briefly what those variations are doing uh, or, or what those uh, deep mutation scanning uh, methodologies can deliver. So deep mutation scanning is a methodology in which um, one uses a mutagenesis library 
uh, which covers each individual variant in a given protein. So one can directly mutate in a single assay each individual amino acid uh, of the protein to each possible other amino acid in the same protein. So in parallel, evaluating the functional outcomes of up to thousands of different variations experimentally with a high confidence uh, methodology. So upon generating this mutagenesis library, which can, which can simply be, be um, ordered, uh, those are transfected into a given cell model. Now in each cell model, uh, those cells are, are harboring different uh, mutants, mutations of, of the um, gene that is supposed to be studied. Subsequently, one one applies a selection assay, and this what the selection assay will, will do, it will result in a shift in uh, the overall relative prevalence of those different uh, mutations, and specifically favor those that are um, either high function or low function in its activity. And so as, as one example, one could uh, envision or imagine here uh, the uh, utilization of a drug transporter that is um, exporting a different, uh, a certain chemotherapeutic drug. So for instance, ABCD1, multi-drug resistance transporter uh, that is relevant for cancer therapy, can be relevant for cancer therapy. So each cell gets a gets a different mutant of ABCD1. Afterwards, one applies a selection assay, which then is the, the exposure to the very chemotherapeutic agent. And um, after some, some additional time and, and incubation, only those uh, cells that have a functional ABCB1 protein, so which means that can still export this chemotherapeutic agent, only those are, are surviving or further enriching and are therefore over-distributed uh, in, the, in the eventual uh, cell population. And therefore, by comparing then the uh, initial diversity library to the library after selection, one can directly uh, extract which variants are uh, overrepresented and which variants are underrepresented. And the overrepresented uh, variants in the very case that I just illustrated, the overrepresented variants would be the functional ones, whereas the underrepresented variants would be those variants that are abrogating or reducing functional activity of uh, ABCD1. And this is an essay that has already done in similar incarnations uh, for a variety of different pharmacogenes and um, is expected to have uh, further impacts on the on the field in the future and by then being able to to directly deliver such a such a comprehensive data set uh, this can be then further used as i, as I mentioned for pharmacogenetic models um, and there the, the most popular approaches at the moment are, are random forest and, and deep neural networks um, again, directly be trained from pharmacogenetic data sets um, for the sake of uh, personalized drug response predictions. Um, so with this, I would like to, to sum up the talk today um, and conclude uh, with some take home messages. So population scale uh, sequencing projects indeed have, have revealed the landscape of human pharmacogenetic complexity, pharmacogenomic complexity over the last years. Um, a plethora of rare variants have been identified in, in the study I listed in the beginning. We identified 72,000 and this is still uh, very much counting. Um, variability in, in drug target genes uh, and their functional impacts are very much understudied compared to uh, pharmacokinetic variability. And in most cases, this is due to the fact that variants there are much lower in, in overall prevalence and the functional effects are much harder to study. Um, computation interpretation of pharmacogenetic uh, complexity requires really dedicated methodologies that goes away from evolutionary conservation and considers pharmacogenetic and structure and direct functional features. So instead of using conflating from pathogenicity prediction, we have to go to direct deleteriousness predictions. And lastly, the mutational scanning offers exciting opportunities in this regard. And with this, I would like to, to close the talk today and uh, thank you very much for your attention.